Welcome to Marriage Night. You guys ready for Marriage Night? All right, it's going to be good, enjoyable. Uh, Let me pray and uh, we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this night, Lord. uh, And we thank you for marriage and we know it's a gift from you. And we pray that you would uh, strengthen, heal, encourage, give new insights. uh, And Lord, that you would have your way tonight, lead by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a couple of things as we start out. Uh, God laid it on my heart about three months ago to have this night, so I just know there's purpose in tonight because when that happens, God always has something good in store. A range of how long you've been married, a range of probably how the marriage is doing. And so with that, here's a car metaphor for some people that like cars. Some of you are coming in tonight and your car's in great shape. You're just, you've come to get some stuff detailed. That's what you're doing here, and that's great that you're here. Some people are coming in, and uh, one tire's really flat, and a few need to be rotated, so that, that can be done here tonight. That's great. And then some people are coming in, and you just know you need a new transmission. Get a new tranny, get a new engine maybe tonight, and and God will do that too. So he's going to meet us where we're at. And as we uh, go through the night, one of the temptations you're going to face is the elbow temptation. (laughs) And and so when I share something, that elbow is just going to twitch. And and what you're going to be saying is, pay attention. That's so you. I've been telling you for years. Listen close, listen closer, and, and so uh, no elbows are needed tonight. And also, the note sheet in front of you, the temptation with the note sheet is you're going to be thinking, I need to write down everything my partner might miss, <laughs> because I know exactly what they need to hear. And so when you go through that note sheet, that's actually for you, not your partner, uh, unless you guys are just different and you want to do it for each other and then just trade at the end of the night. I guess we could allow that. But, but basically, just try to stay focused on your own uh, life and your own walk with God. So uh, with that, uh, we are going to take a look. Uh, our theme verse is from the book of Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And I've got a lot of different verses tonight. If you want to flip through and, and follow along that way, you can or just listen. But uh, Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, we're in chapter 2, verse 15. This is our theme verse. And, and by the way, if you've never read that book together as a couple, I encourage you to do so. It's going to bring a little zing, a little sizzle. It's a pretty interesting book. Uh, we haven't gone through it on a Sunday morning. It's a great book for marriage. So uh, read it together. Talk about it together. Here's the one verse, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Catch for us the foxes. The little foxes that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in bloom. So tonight we're going to talk about foxes and vineyards. Catch the little foxes. What do you think of when you think of a fox? Uh, cunning, crafty, sneaky, under the radar. Okay, that's, that's the foxes we're going after tonight. So five foxes. The first one is foundation. A fox can get in the foundation of your marriage. And this fox, I've got a lot of metaphorical links here tonight. If you're not into that, I just apologize ahead of time. So uh, this first fox is the common gray fox. And this fox is common. It's very common that a foundation of a marriage is just off. It's off. A lot of people get married because they fall in love. And then they say, well, why are you staying married? Because I want to be happy. And is that a good thing? Sure. I mean, who doesn't want to be happy in marriage, right? (laughs) It's, It's clearly a good thing to experience happiness and joy in marriage. But what's the danger? The danger is, what if you hit a month when you're not happy? What if you hit a year when you're not happy? What do you do? Because if everything's based on happiness and the happiness is gone, some people then think, well, I got to bail because I'm not happy, so I'm getting out of here. Uh, So what's the foundation of our our marriage? Uh, Jesus at the center, and I say that, of course, theologically, but also practically. Because it's easy to check that box and say, oh yeah, we want, we want a Christian marriage. We want Jesus at the center. But then what does that look like practically? Is he at the center during the week? Uh, the next thing, uh, it's a covenant with God and with each other. And, and that saves you from a lot of divorce talk. You know, if you're just there to be happy and then things aren't happy, you can say, well, if you don't do this, I'm getting a divorce. And you just start throwing out the divorce word often. You don't need to say the divorce word. This is a, a covenant between God and each other. And then, In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, 
and 32, there's a picture uh, laid out for marriage. And uh, this is the description. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So a great purpose in marriage is unity. Great purpose of unity. This is a profound mystery. There's mystery in marriage, and there's mystery in, in the relationship between Christ and the church, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So when a man and a woman get married together, part of it is to echo the relationship between Jesus and the church, and it's to echo the gospel. So it's not just about selfishly am I happy, it's about are we living with Christ at the center in a covenant where our lives and our marriage just radiate Christ. And, and that's the foundation. So uh, check the foundation, establish it, because commonly in our culture, the foundation's just way off. That, that isn't a part of the foundation. So, so that's the first, fox is in the foundation. Here's the second one. The second one is foolish tactics. Foxes, foolish tactics. This is the bat-eared fox. Has anyone ever seen or heard of a bat-eared fox? <laughs> Doesn't that just sound like a little different or something's not right? Okay, uh, there can be conflict. And actually, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, if you get married, you're going to have a lot of problems. I've never seen that on a wedding card. <laughs> and we're so happy about your marriage. And by the way, when you get married, there's going to be a lot of problems. First Corinthians 7.23, Hallmark doesn't make it. It doesn't sell in the Christian bookstores. But it's just a reality. There's going to be conflict. Two people, two wills, two personalities. So uh, what's important is how you work through conflict, conflict resolution. And if conflict resolution isn't going well, you can drop in a small issue and it can come back 2XL. <laughs> you can drop in a medium issue and it comes back 4XL. And so how do you, Tommy Nelson would say, how do you fight fair? Uh, basically have conflict in a way that honors God. Here's some things to avoid, just real practical. Uh, no violence, no put downs, no screaming and yelling at each other, no exaggerations, stick to the truth, no rolling the eyes and just walking out of the room, no threats, no lies, no lingering. What I mean by that is the Bible says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Work it out together as best as you can that day. Uh, don't be, yeah, for four years I've been resentful. So lingering. Uh, no cursing, no manipulation, no bullying, no constant nagging, no complaining. So with some of those, if, if you've written those down, agree beforehand. <laughs> agree when things are calm and you just, it's Sunday at 1230, you just come home from church and everyone's just feeling happy and holy and then say, let's talk about how we can do conflict and put those boundaries in before the temperature gets cranked up. Uh, another way to think of it, um, well, Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So in any conflict, you can either a gentle answer that brings things down or a harsh word that stirs it up and cranks it up and extends it. Uh, this is a helpful way to think about it. Sometimes in marriage, for whatever reason, uh, we feel a false freedom to bring out our worst with the person we love the most. And so with that, it might be helpful when you're in conflict, just think common courtesy. How would I treat a stranger? I mean, if I treat a stranger that well, isn't my spouse worth treating that well? What if someone from church was here right now? What if Jesus was here right now? And just start thinking about those things, and it puts some helpful boundaries and some limits when conflict wants to just erupt. And, and it just, again, uh, honors the Lord and each other. Okay, here's a third fox. False assumptions. False assumptions. This is the kit fox. Even this sounds kind of nice, isn't it? The smallest fox in mainland U.S., 48 states. Oh, it's just a little kit fox. And we kind of think, oh, it's just a little assumption. What, what could that possibly do? That little kit fox. Oh. And, and so here's, here's the way assumptions work. And this is from 2 Samuel. I'll just read a couple verses. David and the Ammonites in chapter 10, verse 1 uh, in the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died. So picture the Ammonites, the king died. And his son, Hanan, succeeded him as king. So now David thought, 
I will show kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent out a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father, because his father just died. Does everyone tracking so far? David sees, sends out um, the delegation in goodwill. Well, what happens? When David's men come to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite nobles said to Hanan their lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending men to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanan seized David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments, sent them away, and war broke out. Do you see that interpretation? David does an action, sends a delegation. There's two ways they can take it. Oh, that is so thoughtful. Thank you. That is so nice. Wow. Or, ooh, I think I know the motive here. He's coming to spout the land. He's going to take us down. Do you ever have situations that you could either interpret them this way that way. Could be either one with your spouse and, and, and you're thinking through, ooh, I'm going to make a decision. I don't think it was so kind. I think it was one of those over there. And, and you become judge, jury, and the whole deal in your mind. They knew David did something and they weren't sure why, but they started in their mind to go, why did he do it? What's the reason? What's the motive? And, and as they entered into that, they came up with a conclusion, just a little assumption that was false and it led to a war, and and they died because of it. So how does that tie into marriage? You're thinking, all right, interesting, you know, kind of a brave heart scene there, Uh, but how does that tie into marriage? Uh, Assumptions are, are so tempting sometimes. Again, someone's character, was that a really noble thing, or was that just downright manipulative? Uh, you're going to have those choices. It's great if you can ask your partner, could you just tell me? That's the best way to do it. What did you mean by that? Why did you do that? Help me know what you were thinking. Let them share their motives. Let them share their character. And uh, with that, don't try to control four steps ahead and the results and, and so forth. So two ways to take it. it it's, uh, it's extremely, it comes up often in marriage. I'm going to throw out some hypotheticals. If, if, if my wife suddenly gave me a gift certificate to sports authority, she might just be thinking, I like sports. But if I take it as, ooh, she thinks I need to get in better shape and she wants me to work out more. D- do you see that one? If I give her a gift certificate to Crate and Barrel, oh, he thinks I need more cooking supplies because he doesn't like my cooking. You get the thing, sometimes hidden things, like let's say when you start out in marriage, you had some people over and one of you said, you know, I didn't really have the best night, didn't enjoy it that much. And, uh, and next thing you know, you don't have people over for 10 years. And the other person just assumes, well, because I thought you didn't like having people over at dinner, so that's why I just didn't do it for 10 years. <laughs> and, and the other person meant, no, 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 I didn't mean let's not have to do it again for 10 years, I just mean that night didn't go that well. Do you see how it, it just, assumptions can just send the thing in the wrong? Is a visual helping here? <laughs> Uh, okay, so that is a fox, folks. So if, you, if you're prone to make assumptions, if you're a little um, assumptionator, assumpter, if it's overactive, <laughs> slow it down, own it, ask questions, talk about it, apologize when you make a false assumption. Let the other person uh, share. So that, that's another fox. Here's a fourth one. Frustrated expectations. Frustrated expectations. This is the Arctic fox because they can handle the cold. <laughs> Brr, like Minnesota, where I grew up, cold. If you have expectations and they're not getting met, what can happen in marriage? It can get cold. It can get frigid. It can get below zero. Uh, so disappointment happens in marriage when there's unmet expectations. Uh, a lot of times these unmet expectations are not spoken so the other person doesn't even know here's two things you got to think about one is it safe is your marriage safe to really share those and then two do you ask god for courage to share them because if it's safe then ask god for courage that that you can uh, go ahead and share them those those expectations that you've got um let me put it this way there are probably some things your partner would just love if you asked about, noticed, knew about them, 
started to bring into the marriage. Even if you've been married 10, 20, 30 years, there's just probably some things that are existing there. So here, here's a couple categories that might help you uh, as you think about expectations. Time together, conversation together, sharing the depth that you share with each other, expectations with that. Uh, another one, intimacy, the amount of intimacy, just Talking about intimacy, premarital counseling, that's something you put on the table right away. Let's talk about intimacy. How often are you thinking about that? Uh, and, and start communicating expectations. Uh, here's another one. Uh, gifts, flowers, uh, dates. What does that part look like? A another one is uh, amount of work around the house. Who does what? How much? How often? Uh, so a lot of these things, if they're not talked about, they lead to resentment, bitterness, frustration. So we've got to have the courage to go there. And then we ask God for that. And we've got to make sure it's a safe place so we can share these. And we can hear them and not get defensive, but talk about them, pray about them. And maybe they're going to swing over on one person's side. Maybe they'll swing over on the other. Maybe you find something in the middle. But prayerfully, talk through them together. So, so that's another one. Proverbs 13, 12 says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. So describe those expectations. Here's the fifth uh, fox. And this is the downward spirals. Downward spirals. The fox that wants to get in there. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 21. This is one of those verses I, I read. And the first time I read it, I, I think I haven't stopped taking it in. Uh, verse 21, under three things the earth trembles, under four it cannot bear up. In verse 23a, an unloved woman who is married. Wow. So picture an uncherished woman, a woman in a marriage that does not feel special, does not feel cherished. Okay, that, that's one part. How's, how is she going to respond? Uh, so let's just say, hypothetically, she starts to get short or upset and just emotions start to really ramp up because she feels uncherished. And suddenly uh, it's overwhelming and, and she's acting all those feelings. But here's just a little uh, something to think about. When your spouse, when you start to see emotions that are not normal and pretty extreme, Instead of getting angry at them for having those emotions, because that's a natural thing, you know, well, uh, take the approach of trying to figure out what's driving that. Where's that emotion coming from? What's the disappointment? What's going on in the heart that's leading to that emotion? Why? The why question, not just how is the person responding, but why? Why? So you start to minister there. Uh, so let's say then... Just again, hypothetical, let's say the wife, and you could flip the tables uh, on some of these reactions, but let's say the wife starts to become more grumpy or, or crabby. A lot of times, what do husbands then do? I'm just going to step back. <laughs> I don't really want to spend as much time at home. I, I don't get as much respect at home. I don't want to talk as much. I, I might go to bed early. I might work later. I might spend more time with the kids. I might get some new hobbies. Uh, and so retreat starts to happen and, and distance starts to pick up. Um, Ephesians 5.33 says this, However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. So there's the men take initiative like Christ, go love your wife, and then and the wife must respect her husband. So again, uh, wife feels uncherished, husband starts to feel disrespected in the interactions. And, and the hiding and the distance begins. And it's like, how is that cycle going to be broken? And uh, you can break it in Jesus' name. There, there's no cycle that, that can't be broken in, in his name. Uh, so, um, but what helps is just to recognize, oh yeah, I think that does happen. And so cherish your wife. I realize when I don't feel cherished, I start to disrespect you. I know where that's going to lead. I don't want to go down that road. So you start to change the, the downward spiral and, and God can heal. God can create new patterns. Okay. You might be thinking after five foxes, oh, I didn't get my fox. 
I mean, you could say, okay, workaholic, that, that one gets in there. Uh, self-centered, very selfish and self-centered. Another one is stubborn pride, so stubborn. Uh, when you start to think about foxes, you just have to say, yes, we have foxes, we do, and we don't want those foxes anymore. Uh, so with that, there's resources. I mean, there's books, there's DVDs, there's great Christian counseling, there's uh, having a third person or a pastor. I mean, there's a lot of resources as well. There's a lot of help. Um, our church is just here to help strengthen marriages. Uh, but with that, uh, here's, as you talk about these foxes, I just want to give you a communication practical piece that, that you can talk about them. Let's say again, hypothetically, I have this habit of every morning at six, when I get up, or let's say I'm going to work at whatever time, seven o'clock, I just hit the horn about 15 times, okay? Really loud in our neighborhood. Now, um, that's an issue, right? So uh, you're going to have an issue with these foxes. This is how you can walk through it. I was just wondering, do you know that um, you, you hit the horn in the morning? Okay, I'm just checking in, asking to find out, does the other person even, even realize it? Okay, is it even on their radar? Because you know what? They might say, I never hit the horn. <laughs> okay, we got a blind spot. That's, that's what it is. That's helpful to know if we're going to go through it. They just, they don't realize they hit the horn 15 times. Or they say, I know I do. What's the big deal? Other people do it. Okay, now we got um, some denial and, and some pride, <laughs> and there's some walls there. So what are we working with as we're going to walk through it? Because blind spots are easy to fix sometimes. If someone's humble, teachable, oh, I didn't even realize I did that. Oh, will you help me? Let's make a new pattern. But um, the more I know it, I'm going to do it anyways. I don't care. Again, the resources, the help to, to work through that. But teachable hearts in, in marriage and being able to, to talk through that stuff. Uh, with that, I, I want to say this. Foxes don't usually leave by themselves. Amen. Have you ever had gophers in your backyard? I mean, what do you do when there's gophers? Do you just think, oh, you know, they're probably going to leave in a week. Yeah, no, Are they going to leave? Probably not going to leave by themselves, okay? It's going to take some intentional steps. And what, again, you both say, we have foxes. We know what they are. We don't want the foxes. Now we can do something about the foxes. Now we're ready to go. God is going to come in. Uh, here's an encouragement to, to close this section. Um, there, there's a visual, by the way, in Judges 15. Samson literally takes 300 foxes, ties their tails together, lights their tails on fire, and they run wild in the vineyards. So if the fox is doing damage to the vineyards, wasn't a visual yet. Uh, Judges 15. So these foxes are so important to catch. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy not from God. And so what are we going to do? We're going to turn to Jesus. And uh, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus said this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Again, it doesn't matter how many foxes, how big the foxes are, what type of foxes, God can take care of them. You got to believe that. It's the truth. It's the truth. So with that, we, um, can you turn to the person next to you, your partner, <laughs> turn to your partner and say, honey, um, have I told you in a while that sometimes you are really foxy? Okay, okay, so after this fox is a little levity, now turn, give your partner a back rub, take one minute, give your partner a back rub, and then turn it the other way. We're going to take a back rub break right here. Okay, so we got through the foxes. Now uh, the vineyard, it's the, it's the second part of the verse. I'll just read the verse again. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15, catch for us the foxes, even the little foxes, catch them, because they ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. So uh, we're going to talk about vineyards that are in bloom. And again, more practical and, and more scripture as well. The metaphor here is the different soils that are needed in a vineyard, the minerals in the soil uh, for any good soil in a vineyard, these minerals. And uh, I told you this is corny, but I even the acronym is GRAPE, G-R-A-P-E. So the first one is growth. And the, this mineral is the phosphates, 
phosphates with root development and uh, growth. Have you had a conversation lately where you talked about growth, talked about next steps individually, together? What are those goals? Maybe it's financial. Uh, maybe it's uh, goals related to your career or work or serving. And spiritual goals. What about uh, prayer? Spiritually, what kind of input do you want during the week? Uh, going to church, going to a life group, praying together, reading a Bible together, listening to a, a sermon together online, uh, reading a book and talking about it. I mean, th there's so many options. But do you talk about, okay, the next year, the next month, how do we want to grow spiritually, grow in our relationship, grow in communication? What does growth look like? Uh, those next steps overall. Uh, the, the scripture talks about a husband washing your wife in the word, uh, taking the initiative spiritually to, to create an environment at home where, where you can grow and grow together. And some of it will be individual, but there's things you can do together. Talk about what works and what your hopes are, your expectations there. Ephesians 3.18 says that, that we may know how deep and long and wide and high is the love of Christ. Maybe that's the growth area. Just that in our family, the love of Christ would just start to take over more in our hearts and in our marriage and in our parenting, uh, the love of Christ. So uh, recognize what, what that is in terms of growth. Number two, realization. Realization. This is uh, the mineral magnesium, which is in uh, chlorophyll. And chlorophyll takes in the sun's energy. So realization, you're going to take in some important stuff. Now, I've got a few different type of categories here. Uh, realization, it can be helpful and even humorous in marriage when you realize what some of your quirks are. You've got idiosyncrasies, you've got some quirks, you do some things different. I mean, Lori knows about me that when I start to get sick, it's kind of weird, but uh, when I can feel my glands, I'll go to bed with a hat and a scarf, and I just sweat it out. Uh, that's kind of what I do. It's weird, okay? It's different. Uh, but it, it just seems to work. I'm just giving you one example. You've got a lot. When you can recognize them, laugh about them, you know, uh, have a good time with them, just realize what they are. Here's another thing to realize. What season are you in? What season are you in? If you are pre-kids or if you, the kids are out of the house, I just want to tell you some of the things you should really enjoy. Uh, you can just go take walks together whenever you want. Uh, you can go out on dates any time of the week. Late nights, uh, easier for you, traveling. You know, you can both just wake up and have a quiet time with the Lord in the morning when you feel like it, and it's a quiet house, and then talk about it. I mean, so what season are you in? What are the pluses, just the advantages? Realize the, the season. And some people that have kids are just like, oh, that's going to be nice in 15 years to get that again. Uh, just hang in there. You're doing well if you've got kids. Good job. Uh, here, here's another one. Um, this is a realization for me uh, that sometimes... Uh, a temptation is that I can bring my best at church, and then when I go home, leftovers. You know, spend my best at church, and then bring my family leftovers. I could take my wife uh, and kids for granted. You know, I could get consumed with the needs of the church and, and have home suffer in a bad way. So that's something I got to keep realizing what are those things, those areas where you could go off track. And, and, and being aware, being honest about those. Uh, here's another one. When there's disagreements and you've got to try to work it out, who usually gets their way in, in your marriage? Is it about 50-50? Or do we got a 70-30 going on? Do we got a 90-10? I mean, the, the worst interpretation of the, the husband-wife is that, you know, husband says, well, I'm the leader and I'm the leader, so that means I always get my way. Here's my radio station, y you know? That, is, that verse has been yanked out of context in the worst way. Uh, so uh, just generally speaking, it's something to keep an eye on. Realize, you know, who's, who's uh, how are those things playing out? Okay, uh, another one to realize, these are kind of random, but I'll just do one more, is that you might realize that there's better ways to communicate than hints. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So uh, just saying hypothetically, what might be a really obvious hint for Lori to give to me might mean nothing to me, and, and I don't get it at all. And so uh, this is completely, I like to make up hypothetical things that are so ridiculous, but, uh, but it just still brings the point in. Like if you're driving down 101 and heading into Marin County, and maybe Lori looks over where the dump is and says, 
ooh, that dump, I think you can smell it from here. There's a lot of garbage piled up over there. And, and she's thinking, oh, this is clearly a great hint because it's the same day I'm supposed to take out the garbage and I haven't yet. <laughs> and, and so she's saying, look at that dump. There's some garbage piled up. Doesn't smell very good, does it? And, and she's thinking, I just, I was so gentle, but yet I reminded him to take out the garbage. And I just look around and I was like, yeah, that garbage does smell like a dump. You know, and, and I keep going, nothing translated there, nothing connected. So communicating I mean, God, sometimes we just need it straightforward. And you think, oh, am I going to step on your toe? Just bring it, please, because I might not hear it otherwise. Uh, sometimes we, we just think hints are so effective, and, and we need to realize that's not working at all. So, I mean, that's just one communication thing, but uh, it can be a realization that's really helpful in, in marriage. Uh, Proverbs 20, verse 5. Just read this verse. Uh, it says, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out, or a woman of understanding draws them out. These are realizing the deep waters in, in how your spouse is, is, is wired as well. Uh, here's a third helpful thing that the, the vineyards would bloom is appreciation. Appreciation. And calcium is the mineral, and calcium neutralizes pH levels. So when things start to get a little bit acidic in, in the marriage, appreciation. Let, let me just ask you, how often do you appreciate your spouse? How much do you appreciate? How much do you tell them? How do you let them know? How, how do you bring that into the marriage? Uh, there's a classic text in Luke chapter 17. Jesus heals 10 lepers. And how many come back? For anyone that knows the text, how many come back and thank Jesus? One out of ten, you know. I find that that's, that's probably pretty true in a lot of situations. If God blesses me ten times, how many times do I thank him? Maybe ten percent of my blessings. I mean, if I only have today what I've thanked him for yesterday, how much would I have today? <laughs> uh, in marriage, how often could you thank or appreciate your spouse? How often do you actually do it? You know, uh, if they do 10 things really well, how many do you tell them they do well? If they do 10 things for you, how many do you say, yeah, I appreciate that so much and look them in the eye and really mean it. So just getting some more appreciation in, in the marriage helps the pH levels overall. Um, this, is, this is what you might want to write down uh, this week. Just start to write down what are all the things your, your partner does that you appreciate. Just start to write those down. Who, <laughs> laundry might be the top of the list. Who are they? Who are they? Not just what they do, but who are they? Write those down. You know, in premarital counseling, when you get married, you're just like, oh, I love this person so much. Oh, it's because of this, 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 this. And you got to say, okay, stop, stop, stop. We only got an hour for this counseling session. We can't spend it all on what you appreciate about this person. Uh, but get back in there uh, and, and start to realize those again, speak those again. Uh, sometimes it's even the differences. Uh, I tend to be big picture, Lori's details. Okay, I appreciate that about her, that she really nails a lot of details when I'm just thinking big picture. I mean, my, my idea of moving is you just, you get close to the moving day, you get everything, you throw it in the van, and you get over there and you move. You know, she's wrapping up the silverware a month ahead of time. You know, it's really helpful. So, uh, but I appreciate, so appreciate the differences. You know, when, when details are haywire, I'm, I'm not doing too bad because I'm a big picture guy and I can live with a few details that are out there. But I need to be sensitive to how details affect her. If her details are good but big picture's off, okay, I'm, I'm up there at night when she's just falling asleep and I'm still thinking big picture. So appreciate, support each other. I talk more. Lori doesn't talk as much. Appreciate the differences. I tend to do things faster. Lori tends to be more... Um, planned and, and careful with it. Know the differences, affirm the differences uh, as well. And um, with that, I, uh, oh, this little joke. I was, Chuck Swindoll had this from uh, a couple's 50th anniversary, okay, Ted and Bessie. And uh, Ted says, um, or sorry, Bessie says, Ted, I'm so proud of you. And then uh, Ted turns around and says, Bessie, I'm getting tired of you, too. <laughs> so, so he, his hearing wasn't as good. And, and she says, I'm so proud of you, 50 years together. And, and he says, 
I'm getting tired of you too. He, he thought, she said, uh, you know, you, you get it, right? You get it. Uh, so are you more like Ted or are you more like Bessie? You know, are, are you the one that brings the appreciation or are you the one that's kind of got a chip on your shoulder, a little grumpy uh, in, into the deal? Uh, so that's appreciation. Number four is posture. And this mineral is iron. Iron is vital with photosynthesis. And so you need iron so that photosynthesis can happen. This posture is, is so important uh, so that other things can, can happen. Here's some postures that don't work. Just pointing the finger, right? It's the old log in, in my own eye, but picking out the speck in the other person's eye. Uh, here's another posture that doesn't work. Well, well I'm not going to be loving until you're more submissive. Uh, the old not until, you know? I, I'm not going to do that until you do. And in Less, 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 you do less and less and less and less, and pretty soon there's hardly anything there. Uh, the not until posture. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, don't keep a record of wrongs. That's another posture. Well, I just want to tell you, three years ago, and then two years ago, and then 19 months ago, and then it's like, whew, wow, here comes the whole record of wrongs. Uh, and then they've never been dealt with. So those are postures that, that don't work. Um, this is kind of a humorous angle on that one. Marriages sometimes begin warm and intimate, but then they can become cold and businesslike. Consider these seven stages of the marriage. The first year, the husband says, oh, sugar, I'm worried about my little baby girl. You've got a bad sniffle. I want to take you into the hospital. Get a complete checkup. I know the food's lousy, but I've arranged for your meals to be sent to the hospital from your favorite restaurant. It is all arranged. Let's take care of you. That's the first year. Uh, the second year, oh, listen, honey, I don't like the sound of that cough. Now, uh, will you go to bed just for me, please? Okay, that's year number two. Then the third stage, oh, maybe you better lie down, honey. Nothing like a little rest if you're feeling bad. I'll bring you something to eat. Have we got any soup in the house? Okay, so now it's, it's not favorite restaurant. We're down to, is there any soup? Get some crackers around here or something. Fourth stage, look, dear, be sensible. After you fed the kids and washed the dishes, you better hit the sack. <laughs> Did you, get, you catch that one? All right. So now it's on her to do the dishes and take care of the kids. Uh, fifth stage, uh, why don't you just take a couple aspirin? Sixth stage, if you just gargle some salt water or something instead of just sitting around and barking like a seal. And, and then the last stage, for heaven's sake, will you please stop sneezing? What are you trying to do? Give me pneumonia? <laughs> Did you see how the posture changed at each stage? Okay, we, we got to check our posture sometimes in, in marriage. And then just take responsibility and, uh, and we just grow up in some areas as well. Uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, How can two people walk together unless they agree? Unless they agree. Uh, have that solid posture. The last one is uh, number five, energizing. This is the E. This is potassium, which increases metabolism. Uh, so here's a couple things that, that can be energizing in, in a marriage. Um, it can be energizing when something's wrong if both people say and agree, we don't want it to stay that way. We want it to change. Let's, let's do something about it. That can be energizing. Uh, it can be energizing and protect a marriage. Uh, let me say this. I, I heard this from Chris Brown a long time ago. If the husband or the wife is doing something at all inappropriate with someone of the opposite sex, and not just physical, but emotionally, there, there's a veto that, that just says, honey, you, you know, it's the kind of stuff where if you're waking up in the morning thinking, oh, I'm going to see this person I'm not married to, mm, what outfit should I wear today for that person? That's it. I mean, veto. Uh, if, if there's text and calling it, it won. If emails and Facebook is just getting over the top, you know, those kind of things. Veto. You feel safe. You feel protected. You feel energized in, in the marriage. So give your partner veto power when they see something, because it'll probably be a blind spot for you. Um, another one, united on parenting, okay? Don't split it. Don't have it where the kids will say, well, mom said that, but dad said that. You know, or I know I can always get my way with dad, so I'm going to press in there. United front uh, with, with parenting. Talk about things. Hold the same line. It, it, if there's separation there, it can just be a mess, and kids will get in there. So talk about it, pray about it, and come out united. Also with in-laws, united. 
united with in-laws. Uh, let the person whose family it is be the primary person that talks to the in-laws, okay? If, if it's his in-laws, he's the one that primarily talks to the in-laws and, and vice versa. Uh, with that, um, sometimes you just don't realize, when you grow up in a family, you just think everything's normal. That's what everyone does. And, and then at age you know, 12, you start to realize we're a little unique. And then you go off to college and you realize, whoa, yeah, we're really unique. And maybe you go overseas or you get married, and you start to realize we're unique. But sometimes it's age 50 and 60 and you still don't quite realize it. And your spouse says, um, that's a little different. And, and you say, no, that's just normal. That's what everyone in our family does. O okay, uh, you got to talk about that stuff. Don't be in, in denial. If you've got in-laws that are smothering, trying to control the relationship, you got to get some boundaries and some space and be united about that. And the person in the family needs to guard the marriage, leave and cleave. Uh, don't put pressure on your spouse to be just like your family. I mean, if your family always has these traditions and does all these things and that's how it always looks, don't look at your spouse like, well, you better be just like my family. That pressure can be unhelpful. Uh, so those are, again, a lot of these topics we could talk more, but I'm just trying to give you a, a little bit. Here's one more thing that's energizing is, is when you realize what each other really likes and values. So I'll tell you how this can work sometimes is, um, again, the hypothetical, I should clarify when it's hypothetical, uh, but let's say I'm just coming home and I just want to be so helpful to whatever I can do around the house. So right away, I give the kids a bath and I make dinner and I, and I fix the beds if they're not made. And, and I do these things and, and in my mind, um, I'm thinking this evening's going pretty well. Uh, but if the two things Lori really wanted were that I took out the garbage and cleaned the bathrooms, uh, so in my mind, I'm thinking, I just got 96 points out of 100. And, and she's over here in her little calculator going, I uh, didn't do the garbage uh, or the bathrooms. Uh, you're at about 12 points. <laughs> do, and do you see how that can deflate a marriage? Uh, if you don't know the love languages and what your partner values and how to bring those and what they need. And it's that serving. And it might be different one day than the next. But then if they're not doing it to you back and forth, it's like um, it's just off base and, and it deflates instead of energizing marriage. But when you figure that stuff out, when you know your spouse and you bring that and they appreciate that and they're doing it for you, you taste the sweetness of marriage and how God designed it. And, and you think, how can we outdo each other in love? How can I know them better? How can I serve them more? What do they like so much? And, and you're an expert. You're an absolute expert. No one even comes close to knowing your spouse as, as well as you do. And then that kind of stuff is energizing. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19, it says, take hold of the life that is truly life. And marriage is such a gift. It's such a blessing. Uh, when you're, the quality of your life, um, you, the quality of your marriage uh, is a big factor in the quality of your life. It, it really is. Uh, another quote Tommy Nelson said is like, I'm not gonna look back at my life and think, oh, I just invested too much time in my marriage, you know, um, too, too much of my compassion or attention. Uh, it's something you want to overinvest in if possible, if possible. Uh, but it's gonna be so sweet and some of the best times in life are gonna be that closeness of that marriage. There's no relationship you have like it. There's no other person in the earth that can be there for you like your spouse can. And so it's a great privilege, uh, but, but also it's a lot of teamwork and communication. And, and I'll say this, a, a lot of times, the bottom line, I know I've thrown out foxes and minerals and all that, but um, humility before the Lord and each other and forgiveness. And the more that you are willing to be humble before the Lord and with each other, and the quicker and more complete you forgive each other, that is going to set your marriage up for some incredible heights, uh, that humility and that forgiveness. Because um, like plaque, I mean, resentment can just build up and you got to forgive, communicate, be humble with each other. Uh, so this is what we're going to do. I've got five questions right here. See, the really good stuff doesn't happen here tonight. The really good stuff is in the application. So we're going to take um, five minutes right now and, and look at these questions. And I just want you to write it down 
just for you. Uh, number one, what are the foxes you need to catch? What are the main foxes? Number two, how can you get rid of them together? Okay, he, here's a question I want you to ask sometime this week. Okay, here's my challenge. Uh, whatever, you, sweetie, whatever name you say, is there anything that I could do differently in this marriage that would be very helpful? And just give them that. Just give them that. And when they start to share, don't say, well, you always, I don't do that. Oh, I don't do that that often. Don't come back with any of that. Just, just say, is there anything, honey, that I could do differently that would really help our marriage and uh, would, would be helpful? So, so that's the part of together, doing it together. Number three, what do you appreciate about your spouse? And then how can you share that with your spouse? Number four, what steps can you take to help your communication? What are the keys? And then number five, how can you grow spiritually in your relationship? It's like every weekend here, there's the Word of God and there's practical stuff, but it's not what gets in your head. It's, it's then living it out. So it's what you take and do with it. Um, that's where you're going to see God do incredible things. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you again for the gift of marriage. And uh, Lord, we thank you for nights like this when we, um, some, as, as we said, detailed, some flat tire, rotate the tire, some new transmission, and yet, Lord, you know each marriage and, and what we need, and we want to live in closeness with you and with each other. We pray for healing, for courage, uh, for any changes that would be good, and for forgiveness. Father, if there's uh, bitterness and resentment that's built up from disappointment, we pray for forgiveness, we pray for healing, we pray for change, and a lot of humility. And again, give us the courage to be honest with each other. We commit the good things that you're going to do uh, as we walk with you through this part of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for watching and also give you a couple of opportunities to connect with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can come join us at one of our weekend services that Saturday night at 5.30 or Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30. Also, our 10.30 service is live streaming on our website, sebchristian.com. Click the live button. You can watch the entire service. But if you're in Sonoma County, please come join us or come up to Sebastopol for a day. Enjoy the city. And then also uh, make sure you say hello and stop in. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we have a team of people that are ready to pray for you. If you want more information about this ministry or our church, or if you have any questions about the teaching, please contact us, 707-823-8242. Also, on the website, there's the email for all the staff members, so you can send us an email too. Again, thank you for watching. Our prayer is that this program would be used by God to draw you closer to Jesus, and you would know how much He loves you.